Welcome to the Real Estate Strategies Podcast, a place for conversations that matter in order to obtain infinite wealth. I'm your host, Ken McElroy. This show is meant to keep you updated on what is going on in real estate while getting you on track to have infinite wealth and financial freedom. This episode, as well as all the others, can be downloaded on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and various other platforms so that you're able to listen on the go. To get my weekly newsletter where we keep these conversations going and explore the trending topics in real estate today, please go to www.kenmcelroy.com slash news. Let's dive into today's episode. Hey, everybody. So today I'm very excited to have my friend Brandon Turner on and I'm with uh, Daniil, our co-host. Hello. So, hey, uh, Brandon, welcome, welcome, welcome. And uh, I cannot wait to chat with you about your new book. Oh, thanks, man. This is this is an honor because your your book changed my life. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for you. So I appreciate you a ton. Well, I, I obviously I've been following you. It's fun to watch people that are putting, uh, you know, their discipline into action. You've obviously done that. Um, and we met in Seattle years ago through our good friend, Tal- Tarl Yarber. And, and um I've been following you ever since, and I've been on the bigger pockets, and you've been on my stuff. And um, and thank you, by the way, for sending me your uh, most recent two books. And I noticed it was interesting when I got it. I didn't realize you did one book for small deals and one book for big deals. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. So anybody who's been in real estate kind of realizes there's there's two different approaches to real estate, right? There, it's not like a unit number. It's not like it starts at five and you suddenly magically approach real estate differently. I mean, technically at the at the lending level, yes, five units and greater is different. But it's like, you know, when you, when I was young, like I would I would do most of my own repairs. My tenants had my cell phone number. Uh, I would go to a local bank to get the loan. It was just, you know, go to my whatever bank I banked at to get the loan. And like, that's like the very, like the smaller way to approach real estate. State. Nothing wrong with that. You can build an entire portfolio that way. I know a lot of landlords who have had a lot of success with that. But if you're trying to take down like a hundred or two hundred or five hundred unit apartment complex, it is an entirely different game. I mean, we use the same words, cash flow, appreciation, but man, the game is just so different. And so, uh, as uh, my co-author Brian Murray and I were sitting there trying to ch- chat about what we're going to write these multifamily, this multifamily book on. We're like, this can't be one book because it's two, it's two completely different businesses. So that's why there's two books, one on the small side, one on the large side. Yeah, I really thought that was smart. You know, I didn't realize that you had done two uh, when you sent them to me, I don't know, a couple months ago. And I was I was reading through them. I'm like, this is brilliant because that's a question that we get asked a lot, you know, like how did you start? And then everybody who's everybody sees what you're doing and what I'm doing and they're like, we'll never get there. And, you know, sometimes they lose hope. So let's start right <laughs> sure. down to the very beginning. Uh, you know, I know like we all started very humbly. I started with a two bedroom, two bath. I yep. put my own, you know, my own savings into it. I know Danielle did the exact same thing and she was the next school teacher. Um, and let, let's talk a little bit about your story because I think a lot of people, they, they listen to us, they hear us and they're like, you know, I'll never get to that level, but you've actually You've actually been at it and uh, for really, you know, I guess I could say this, but not for that long. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, you, you know, I guess you started when you were 21 years old. But still, the fact is, is that, you know, the, the way you soared through this industry and what you're doing now is, is, is incredible. Let's start at the very beginning. Sure, man. Yeah. I mean, I got started my very first like rental. I mean, I did like a, I owned a house and I rented the bedrooms out. So I kind of did it that way. Um, got in, but I sold that like pretty quickly on when I got married. And that's when I kind of look at my, the start of my real estate journey is I kind of look at it in three phases. I'll go through all three phases real quick. Phase number one was buying that very first duplex. So I lived in half of it, rented the other half out. We call it house hacking today. And that was like the small real estate, trying to figure things out, you know, almost n- really never any money down because I didn't have any money. I uh, didn't have much credit, didn't have much of anything. So that was like phase one was that. And I, I bought a number of like these little deals, like houses, like little cheap houses under $100,000, uh, little duplexes, tripl- I bought a triplex for 45000 that kind of like real cheap, rough area investing where I did everything myself. So that was phase one. Phase two was actually started when I read the ABCs of real estate investing. And I read that book and I'm like, dang, 
uh, I want to get into multi, like the larger multifamily. And so I read that on a Saturday and I love this story because I read it on a Saturday. And uh, then I read this, you know, the follow-up, uh, the advanced guide to real estate investing that you wrote. And I, I was like both in one day. I read, I loved them both. I read them one day. The next morning I go to church of all places. I go to church and there's this old couple there and I'm telling them, I'm like, I really want to buy an apartment someday. I just read these amazing books. They were so good. And they're, they're all about apartment complexes. And they looked at me funny and they looked at each other. And then they said, well, it's interesting, Brandon, we actually have an apartment we want to sell. And it was like the most like mind blowing coincidence. Right. But at the same time, it's not, I probably told 10 people that day, how much I loved the idea of buying apartments. It's one of those, if you don't put it out there into the world, you're never going to get anybody that wants to help you. So anyway, that led to my phase two, which was the uh, world of larger multi. And really it was 24 units. So it was pretty small still. And uh, yeah, I lived in phase two then for a number of years. And just the last two years really graduated to phase three, which was I built a team and scaled up rapidly. Yeah. And I definitely want to talk about that. And what about you? Like you started with your... Yeah, uh, I kind of started the same way. So it's very cool. Yeah. Nice. yeah. Well, with the, uh, you started as a teacher. Yeah. And started, you know, started saving your money and realized that you're not going to make... It, it, I remember her telling me the story. Is she, she, she was meeting with the principal at her school and the principal said, you, you know, you too can make 42 grand someday after 10 years. You know, <laughs> like, well, I, like, if you just put your head down, you could soon be running one of these schools. And she's like, okay, I need to figure out another way, right? Yep, definitely. So let's uh, let's jump right in. Um, you know, a lot of people want to try to do the transition from, you know, the, the call it the, you know, the ones and twos and, uh, you know, the house hacking and stuff like that. And, and, and I think that's a great place to start because you make a lot of small mistakes. Uh, but then that next step, that 24 unit, you know, uh, obviously you read a lot of people stop right there. They don't take action. You obviously took action. I think I remember you telling me that, wasn't there a lot of vacancies and wasn't there some the complications around the financing? So I, I want people to understand <laughs> that, um, like, that, you know, you're not getting deals that are packaged. Like the brokers are not bringing you deals. They're like, oh, okay, let, you know, let me really think about this and run the numbers. These things are a mess, right? Yeah. I mean, the thing was 50% empty. So I had 12 units that were rented, 12 that weren't. Uh, the old couple that I bought it from, they had actually sold it like seven years earlier on a like seller financing. And the guy that had bought it just drove it into the ground. But because they had the seller financed on it, they were able to eventually, he had stopped paying them and they foreclosed on him and they took it back. And so now here they are in the early seventies and they're, they retired now for like a decade. And all of a sudden they have this 24 unit that's half empty at a part, they don't, they don't want to be in that phase of their life anymore. So yeah, so they, they was definitely a distressed asset. And I'm not sure, like, I'm not even sure I got a good deal on it. What made it a good deal was the fact that I was like willing to get in there and like, I worked at it. And yeah, I had no money to even buy it. I mean, in talk with the guy that was wanting to sell it, I had no money to buy it. And, but he, he trusted that I would like get it done. So they basically did this kind of cool, like, it was, we started with a lease option. So I rented the entire property from them because I didn't even have enough money to pay closing costs. Like they were gonna willing to do no money down, but I couldn't even afford the closing costs. So I did a rent to own essentially on the entire complex uh, for the first six months. I then used that time to get a couple units rented out and save up the, I think it was $4,000 I needed for closing costs. And uh, then we transitioned it over to an actual seller finance deal. So I, I, bought it in my, you know, in my name at that point, they carried the contract. And again, one unit after another, my wife and I would work till three in the morning, painting units, putting carpet in. I learned how to do everything uh, there. And over the course of two years, got it turned around, fixed it up, and got 24 fully paying units, uh, you know, tenants in there, bring it from about 450 average rent up to about 600 average rent over a couple of years. So uh, well, and I remember, didn't you, you almost doubled the value, right? From what yeah. you uh, purchased. Yeah. And we did, we paid for, we, we paid for, what was it? 475 for it when we bought it, maybe it was 450, something like that. And we ended up selling it now like five years ago. So about six years into it, we sold it for nine or just under nine. Um, and so it was a, I mean, it was a turnaround, but it was also, I mean, it was a lot of work in the process, but it, I think I cleared quarter million dollars in actual profit at the end of the day when I, when I sold it, which really was like propelled me into the next level into the kind of that level three, which is where I had the confidence to go into the bigger deals. But yeah, it was a, it was a phenomenal deal all the way around. 
And and I wouldn't you agree, Brandon, that there are deals like that all over the place. I mean, you just happen to mention it, and you were sitting next to somebody at church. I mean, <laughs> people don't realize they're not always advertised. They're not always out on the internet. But there are deals. There's a lot of mismanaged, you know, broken deals with people at different stages in their life. That that uh, you know, and I think what happens is everybody wants them served up to them. You know, like, oh, and, and, I mean, but that's what everyone wants. And, and really, like, like what you did, you put you put it out there and all of a sudden, you know, it started to come back. Right. Yeah, it really is. It's it's, it's I'm such a big believer in like tell the universe or tell people, tell the world what you want. Like know what you want and then tell everybody because people love to help people who are specific with their goals. Right. Like if you had a friend come to you and be like, hey, I'm looking for a job. You'd be like, all right, well, good for you. You know, ah, you got it. But if they were like, hey, I'm looking for a job at a hospital somewhere in the Scottsdale area you immediately would be like, okay, who do I know that can help this person? Who do I know that works at a hospital? And you would go out of your way to help that person because they're so specific on what they want. There's just something about human nature. We love to help people who are specific about their goals. Right. Uh, in fact, that's how I got the my very first mobile home park is I went and spoke at some real estate club out in New York City. It was a terrible trip. My daughter got sick on the way there. She was like one years old at the time. She got sick, threw up all over my wife and I on the car on the flight over. It was like everything imaginable could go wrong. That trip went wrong. And I, the whole time I'm like, what am I doing? Why am I flying across the country to go speak for, for no pay? And I'm just, I'm just because I say yes to everything. And so I'm at this event and I, I mentioned to the crowd, you know, there's probably 50 people there. And I said, yeah, I'm looking for a 50 unit mobile home park with city sewer and water. And a week later, one of the attendees that was at that event, event emailed me and said, Hey, I saw you speak. And you said you uh, had a 50, you're looking for 50 unit. I got a 50 unit mobile home park just came across my desk. That looks like a good deal. Do you want it? And uh, that's what got me into the mobile home park game was again, telling the world what I wanted. Well, and I love that too, because you know, one of our top questions we get is I want to syndicate, but like, how do I raise money? Where do I find money? But it's like, have you even told anybody that you want to do this or that you're trying to raise money? You know, the first thing you do is you just mention it to everybody, you know, and eventually yep. somebody's going to know somebody. Yeah. It's people. There's so much more money out there today than there is, than there are deals. The problem is like, you just look like people just look silly when they're like, oh yeah, I'm trying to raise money for real estate. Well, what are you buying? Oh, I don't know. Real estate. You just look, <laughs> you just look silly. Like I'm right. not going to put money with you. I think, and there's one other thing that there's some, there's some wisdom in there. Cause I did the same thing. I've been accused of why are you flying over here, you know, and speaking and, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You know? And, and I, I think that, um, uh, you know, you and I are similar in the, in, in the fact that if, if you just teach and, and you just try to help people, it comes back to you. Uh, you can't go across the country and go speak to 50 people and expect something, uh, you, you know, but, I can assure you guys that it does happen. If, if you're out there and you're trying to help people, you're trying to, uh, you know, uh, tell them about some of the knowledge and some of the things that you've done, just like you did, Brandon, early on, I'm sure you're still going to continue to do. Uh, isn't that true? It's so true. Yeah. People it, teaching builds such trust and credibility at scale in our modern world or today, anybody, anybody can become a teacher. They don't have to do it. You, you know, you actually go to, you don't even have to go to school to be a teacher anymore. Right. You just go on the internet and you go on social media and you start talking about what you know. And you're like, Oh yeah, this is one thing I know. And like, and the reality is everybody is farther along the journey than somebody that's behind them, right? Like there's always somebody ahead and always somebody behind. So if you just start looking at the people behind you saying, Hey, here's what I figured out so far. You know, I, I figured out how to buy, you know, a couple duplexes, or I, I figured out how to buy a couple small multifamilies. There's a lot of people who would love to learn what you just figured out about those small multifamilies. So get out there, like, teach what you know, talk about it, help people. And it'll come back to you all the time. Hey everybody, Ken McElroy here. I'm excited to announce the release of my newest master course, Buying Your First Rental Property. Whether you're new to real estate or you want to revisit the fundamentals, this course will take you to the next level. We're also offering a special bundle when you buy this with my Real Estate Investing Master Course. So let's get started on your future today. I'll tell you a story I haven't told much. Um, you know, so. Uh, I was out uh, early on, obviously syndicating deals in the early 2000s, and um, and, and find trying to find uh, investors. And that's when I ran into Kim and Robert Kiyosaki. Is they were brought to me. I was in a group EO back then, and uh, one of my friends knew them and said, "Hey, you, you should meet 
but the, this couple. Well, I actually hadn't read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Um, it had just come out. So call it 99, 2000. And uh, so I obviously, like you, went to the went to the bookstore, read the book. I And I had a meeting with them at the Phoenix Country Club. And um, not knowing, obviously, where it would all go. Not, you know, not really even knowing. And nobody at the time knew that Rich Dad Poor Dad was going to be what it was going to be because it was new. And so Robert says to me, he goes, hey, would you come out and speak? at one of my events and I didn't even know who he was. So I was like, you know, sure, you know, I'll come out. So kind of to your point, right? So I went out, I drove out on a Sunday and I spoke for an hour and he had about four or 500 people in the crowd, I think at the time, and he was doing his teachings. And um, Kim said, be ready. Like these people are going to like mob you at afterwards. And that's what I, that's when I got it. I was like, Oh, like, like, you know what I've been doing and, kind of, you know, independently is beating my head against the wall, buying deals and all this experience around property management, all that. There are people that want this. And um, and that's actually what that's actually from there I, I I wrote my first book thinking, okay, this is a great way to to put it all in, in writing. So I don't have to keep answering these emails and phone calls and all these kinds of things. And from there, of course, then all of a sudden, it became the you know uh, obviously we I've had a little bit more of a platform and people started to invest and and so I think that people don't understand the small seeds you know along the way like you said when you flew across the country stood in front of the room with no expectation back and that fifty unit I'm sure it's worth a lot more now and uh, isn't it true that there's a lot of small little things like that along the way. That um, people that you know that don't ever get any kind of notoriety. Yeah, well, it's amazing. You know, like you you never see. There, there's a great quote from Steve Jobs that says, "You can't connect the dots looking forward, only looking back." And I always like that that concept of you never know what's going to take you to that next spot to the next one. The only way to do it is just to keep moving forward and keep trying. Like you're not even trying to connect dots. You're just being an open individual. It just says yes to things. Now it's hard for somebody who's like, you know, once you have a career, you know where you're headed. It's hard to say yes to every opportunity that comes your way. But still being the type of person who says yes more than no uh, and being open to ideas and opportunities and at least conversations about things, it just you never know five years later that one of those things made a little pivot in your life. Like me picking up the ABCs of real estate investing, right? That made this little pivot that led to another conversation that led to this, that led to that. And then down the road, you're a completely different person because of those moments. Yeah. So many people sit there and they look at what you and, and, and we all have and they say, wow, must be nice to just go buy a 500 unit apartment complex, but nobody's given me a 500 unit apartment complex. I'm like, you ain't even got a duplex yet. Go, go buy a duplex. And that'll lead to the 500 unit five to 10 years from now. But quit looking at what I got and comparing it to what you got because we're in different parts of our journey. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think the, what, what's interesting is um, like you, I had massive fear around using my own money on that first deal, yeah. raising money from people that I didn't really know very well, uh, you know, that said, we trust in you. And so, you know, there was this massive fear that I had that first time to meet with a lender, not really understanding, you know, everything around a loan term sheet and all that, what I was signing, these big loan documents and, you know, and, and what you're kind of getting into, um, you know, you do have to take a bit of a leap of faith. Now with a, with team members that kind of help support you, right? Yeah. The team was, I mean, it's everything. Like, I feel like I don't know half of what, like what the terms are still because I got smart people that figure this stuff out for me, like at, at such a high level. I mean, like, I just like see these documents come through my email and I'm like, that's an 87 page, like legal document that some lawyer just spent a lot of time doing. God bless him. Cause I like that. me having to write up 87 pages of that legal. Uh, no, that sounds terrible. I can review stuff. That's great. But yeah, there are people that do all of these things. That's one thing I love about the large multifamily game is that there are people like I didn't have to figure out how to get the money wired into my checking account, you know, to be able to buy a deal. I got a guy that does that. Like he figured that out. And I'm like, that's just like, that's probably my favorite thing. If I did to really narrow it down, my favorite thing about the large multifamily game is that it is a team sport. It's not, you're not playing tennis by yourself. You're playing basketball with a team of, uh, and if you get the right people, it's a team of superstars. It's a lot of fun. Right. Well, I think the one thing that all three of us have in common are um, that we don't like being told what to do, but <laughs> we want to be able, we want to be able to do what we want to do. Right. Yeah. Like from, from, and from wherever we want to do it. And I, I actually think there's a lot of people that fall into that category. 
You want to chat about, uh, you, you, I mean, you moved to Hawaii. We're both from Washington State, ironically. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I, I grew up in Everett. Right. I went to school in Tacoma. And, um, but you moved to Hawaii, uh, you know, that, was it during the pandemic? It was right before the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. I've been here three years now. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. And so you're, everything <laughs> you're doing right now is from there. You know, it's, it's yeah. awesome. And, and people don't realize that they are, really are in control uh, once you get to this the passive income and, you know, and this model going, right? Yeah. You know, four years ago, my wife and I sat down, it was on, it was on New Year's Eve, almost four years ago now, three and a half years ago. It was on New Year's or New Year's Day. We sat down, we do it every year. We do a goal setting retreat and we sat down at this restaurant out on the coast of Washington state, a uh, little town called Seabrook. And we're sitting at this restaurant. We did it. What, what is our goals for the next few years? Like what's our goal this year? And then what's our five-year vision look like? We sat down and I, and I have this piece of paper still. And I wrote within five years, I want a house in Hawaii with an extra unit that family and friends can come and stay at. And so we can kind of like have this cool kind of like vibe or like house with, with people that we love out in Hawaii. And we're like, Oh, that sounds scary. Five years. I mean, I don't know if we could ever do that in five years and six months late. I mean, this, this is now again, three and a half years ago. So six months later, we buy a house in Hawaii with, you know, like an extra unit, actually two extra units that family and friends can come stay at. And it just, again, just shows the power of like defining what you want writing it down. And then all of a sudden it, it's not so scary anymore. It, it like opens up for you. And so again, yeah, I love the fact that real estate allows me to do that. I can live in Hawaii and uh, that it was kind of my wife and I's five-year vision got done in less than a year. It was cool. Yeah. And um, not to mention the fact that it is scary at the time. So a lot of people yeah. shut down right there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at the time when they're actually discussing it, the, there's all this, the, you know, I call it the little voice, you know, starts mm -hmm. popping up and it starts to, you know, sit, put all this rational uh, thought in there and it kind of, it kind of kills your dreams. Right. Yeah. I mean, it did. In fact, like when I, when I made that goal, I was like, well, it's probably not going to happen in five years, but you know, maybe someday, maybe 20 years from now I can have that. Right. Uh, I remember thinking that, but then what we did is we started taking these little action steps that would, allow, for example, for that one, we were like, well, why don't we just go to Hawaii for a couple months? That's a pretty easy thing. I mean, it costs some money, but uh, why don't I just go to Hawaii for a couple months and I can learn to surf. And, and that was no commitment. It was just an idea of like, let's just go see if we can spend a little bit of time there. Right. So if, with anything in life, when you're afraid, if you're like, oh, I'm scared to buy a 50 unit apartment complex, all right, maybe just buy an eight unit, see what you're trying, or maybe don't even buy it. Maybe just go and partner with somebody else. Maybe just invest in somebody's syndication, just get your feet wet a little bit. And all of a sudden it becomes less scary because it's not that things are actually scary. Scary, right? Like it from Stephen King. He's scary, right? The, the scary clown. Like there are scary things in this world. A 50 unit apartment complex is not scary. It's simply something we don't understand. So that we, we say it's scary because our, our biology, we're wired to think that things unknown are scary, but in reality, it's just unknown. And so if you make yourself aware of it and get yourself familiar with it, all of a sudden it becomes a lot less scary. In fact, I remember, so we we came to Hawaii for the few months and we found this house, like at the very end of the trip, we found this house on this property. And I was like, this is it. This is what I've always dreamed of. Like, and I couldn't even verbalize it until I saw it. And I was like, this is it, but it was $2 million. My average home that I bought before that was about a hundred thousand. So we're talking like 20 times more expensive. And I remember calling my buddy, David, who's the co-host of the bigger pockets podcast with me. And I called him and I'm like, I found the most perfect house, but there's no way I could buy this thing. And he goes, well, why not? I'm like, well, I mean, obviously it's $2 million. And he's like, well, yeah, but you make good money. I was like, that's besides the point. I mean, it's $2 million, David. And he goes, well, tell me about it. So I'm like, well, it's got these three units. He's like, well, what would they rent for if you, if you couldn't live there? I'm like, ah, oh, probably about, you know, 2,500 bucks a piece. He's like, in other words, worst case scenario, you rent out all three units separate. You move back to the mainland. You go live in your crappy little duplex house because you failed. And now you're making profit on a cash flowing rental in Hawaii. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess, I guess that is worst case scenario. He's like, and then 20 years from now, that $2 million house with an ocean view and a pool in Maui, what's that worth? More or less than $2 million. Oh yeah. I guess that's probably worth a whole lot more. He's like, so worst case, you're a multimillionaire because you took this risk. Yeah. Worst case, I'm a multimillionaire. All of a sudden it's not so scary anymore. So I bought the property. It's just, yeah. It's fear. Yeah. And also guys pay attention who was on the other end of that phone, because um, that's an important piece. You know, that I, I don't want to just brush over that. The, I have, we all have those kinds of conversations with friends yeah. that, 
either support you, mm -hmm. uh, encourage you, or, or um, you know, I, I say, you know, kind of take the air out, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, so, right? Yeah. That right? That's such a good point. I never thought about that before, but what if I had called my parents, right? Yeah. What if I had called somebody like somebody who didn't have those questions? I never thought about that, but like the fact that like, the person you call in those times makes such a difference to the, like, what would it, my parents would have been like, yeah, you're right, Brent. That's crazy. Yeah, you can't crazy. afford that. You're crazy. <laughs> and they would have talked me out of it. That's funny. I never thought, I never thought about that before that that could have gone the opposite way just based on who answered the phone. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. 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 And, and I, I just, I, I, the only reason I bring that up is because as what happens is as your circle, you know, evolves and you, you're, you know, you're raising bigger equity and you're finding better deals and your brokers and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter. You still have people that say you can't do that. And you have yeah. other people that say, you know, go for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. It's, it, you got to guard who's around, who, who's around you and who do you let into your circle? And you don't want just yes people either. Like David's the opposite of a yes person. He's actually like the most no person I know. Uh, same with like Josh Dorkin, you know, founder of bigger pockets, very much a no person. Uh, but I mean that in a good way. It's like the, the they're they're not going to let you do something stupid. They're going to actually like think through it. But that's exactly what David did. So yeah, you don't want the yes people. You don't want the no people. You want true friends who believe in you and support you and are going to help you figure out a way to get there. Because of course, there's always a way to get there. Whatever you're trying to get to, there's always a way. And so a very small percentage of this world population are the kind of person who says, let's figure it out and let's help you get there the right way. And those are the people you want to surround yourself with. That's right. So let's jump right into your books because, um, you know, when you sent them to me, first of all, I think the industry needed kind of fresh new books. My book has been around for 20 years. Um, candidly, it's dated. I'm, I'm, I'm redoing it right now because I, well, I went back and read it. I was a little embarrassed. <laughs> it's still like, awesome. Oh it's still awesome. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, and uh, hopefully that never goes on with you, but in 20 years, when you go back and look at this book, you're going to, there's, like, like one of the things that I noticed, um, crowdfunding, uh, crowdsourcing wasn't even a thing, you yeah. know, when I, when I wrote the book, when, you know, you know, so all those kinds of things, I'm trying to update the book right now. I'm working on all that, but I'd love, you know, you've got the seven different types of, of small multifamily real estate and, you know, kind of the best rental property. So can you walk through that? Cause I, I really, really enjoyed the way you laid it all out. Sure. Yeah. So I went through these different types. When I looked at like the properties I own and the people that I that I know own, uh, I thought it would make it a little less scary for people when they're thinking about multifamily if we gave things names, right? So I'll give you a few examples. So there's the the side by side. Usually it's a duplex, but sometimes you find a side by side triplex or fourplex, and it's just like. These, uh, these small little apartments that are usually like, it's a side-by-side -side duplex. There's also the up and down, which is the, you know, there's a unit on top, unit on the bottom. Those are all over the place. In every market I think you go to, you can find a side-by-side -side or an up and down. Now, why is this important? Well, uh, there's these little things like you learn, for example, a side-by-side -side, when there's like, they're next to each other. They're not on top. The water lines are much more likely to be separated or easily separated if they're not already. Well, why does that matter? Well, if you're owning like, a, you're going to buy a duplex or triplex or fourplex, if you can shift the water costs onto the tenant, it's going to stabilize all your expenses. It's going to drop your expenses. You're going to make way more money. And almost nobody thinks of this. Like when they're trying to buy like the small multifamily, they don't even like the thought of who pays the water doesn't even come into the picture. But I mean, that could easily be half of your profit is just the water bill or the water and garbage and, you know, sewer bill. So depending on which way you go there can help make a big difference. Another one I call is the monster house. I own a bunch of these. Well, a few of these, I should say now I've gotten rid of a lot of them and they're, they're dangerous as a monster would be. And the, the idea of a monster house is it's like a single family house that has been converted over the past hundred some years into multifamily. So somebody added on this and they took the garage, turned it into this. They added this little piece on the side. They got a little studio up there. They turned the attic into this and they're usually just poorly done. <laughs> like the, the, you're, you're likely never gonna be able to separate the water meters and something like that. Uh, they usually are super thin walls. There's all these problems. I'm not saying they're bad. They can just print money. I've got a few that just print money. I lived in uh, one of those in college. Did you? It was, oh yeah. We were in the basement and it was all, it was just gross. And like, it, it was just, it was bad. <laughs> yeah, they're, they, they are a, a different, a different beast right there, but man, they can make really good money. 
Uh, and so th- there's this, just, you know, there's the garden type apartments, which are more like the kind of the suburban, usually a couple of floors, maybe two or three stories total. There's, you know, the, 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 obviously the large stuff, the high rises and it's just recognizing what these are and then what you want. You're like, Oh, I'm really looking. I think a side-by-side duplex sounds great. Now, when you go to your real estate agent and say, hi, I'm looking for a side-by-side duplex. All of a sudden, like you look like, you know, what you're talking about, even if you have to explain what that is to the agent. Again, you're way more clear in your goals. Now the agent can be like, oh yeah, let's go find you one of those. And now you just, you're, the chance of getting it is so much greater. Right, right. That's really good advice. Like really good advice. Because most people just, they're not, not specific with the realtor or anything. And yeah. Tell them that. Yeah, yeah really what are you looking for? A deal. Yeah, everyone wants yeah. a deal. I like that because I think a lot of times when people talk about buying real estate or buying multifamily, it all gets lumped into one big category. Yeah. So you broke it up into the two books and then you broke it up into the types, which I really like because to your point, what happens is you get into all these nuances, guys, when you're buying stuff for, from common area water to boilers to independently metered to common area lighting, you, you know, and uh, HOAs, landscaping. Yeah, even if, uh, you know, when you, when you buy something that has two in it, uh, there, there are, you know, you potentially could have battles about who pays for what. Uh, there's all this stuff that goes on af- operationally, right? And I'm sure you learned a bit about that uh, after you bought a few of these. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there, there's things like we'd have properties where like the, you know, like even like a garden style where you have somebody upstairs usually and somebody downstairs, usually they're like four, you know, whatever. But like we had a times where like the tenant, like the tenant upstairs just walks too heavy. And that makes people downstairs irritated uh, or they like throw stuff off their deck. That was a common thing. So just understanding these little things that they go with that property type, the side-by-side usually has their own yard, oftentimes has their own garage. If so, great. They can have their own lawnmower and you don't have to pay lawn care. So like, that's a, again, one of the reasons I love the side-by-side duplexes is t- especially the ones that have the uh, garage in the middle and each have their own little gra- garage. It's such a simple rental property to own and it's very low maintenance, but yeah, just knowing what these things are, they can help a ton. So, so let's talk about, so when you first kind of started to, you know, obviously before you made the big leap to, you know, call it the gardens, I guess yeah. the one we were talking about, it was in yeah. Texas, right? The one you just bought. The, the one I just bought. Yeah. It's in Texas. Yeah. So what time frame was that from, from beginning to, I know you still have a lot of properties of cash flow and all that, but what time frame was that? Yeah. So if we're thinking like, so I'm 36 right now, I was 21 when I bought my first property. Uh, I was 20. 5 26 when I bought that second or like that uh that small apartment the 24 unit so kind of phase 1 was the first few years trying to figure it out phase 2 was that and then it was 3 years ago that I went to a conference called the best ever conference out in uh it was in Denver I think Joe Fairless put it on and so it was 3 years ago so I would have been 33 at the time and that's where I was at this conference speaking on stage and man I was like I don't belong here like everybody here is doing these big apartments and big syndications and all this cool stuff and here I am with my like few tiny little properties out in, in western Washington and I just felt like out of place uh and what I realized was like I was at this point where I was bored with my real estate and I was just coasting with my 30, 40 units, whatever I had at the time. I wasn't really doing much. I just, you know, they were all just stabilized and it was fine. And not that like more units make you happier and more money makes you necessarily happier, but there's such value in the climb, right? In the, in the challenge and like, oh, I'm going to get to that new level and setting goals and then going towards those goals. That's where a lot of, I think, happiness and fulfillment is. So I decided then and there, I was going to get into the syndication game and kind of get to that third level of real estate investing. And it terrified me, but that's where it all started was at that conference. And I read a book called the vivid vision or called vivid vision by Cameron Harold. And it was all about just like, it doesn't matter where you go, but define where you want to go. Like lay out a very clear picture of where you want to go. So that's what I did. I was like, all right, I'm going to have $50 million of real estate. I'm going to have a thousand rental units. I'm going to do all that in three years. And so I laid it out then and uh, 18 months, that was really two years ago from right now is when I wrote that vision, not even two years. Uh, And we're at, I think 2,500 units right now, about $150 million in real estate, or at least we'll, we'll be at 200 million by the end of the year, by the ones we have under contract right now. So yeah, I kind of blew by the goal doing that. Well, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, cause I, I believe a lot of people look at goal setting vision, you know, vision boards or, you know, whatever. I know there's a bunch of ways 
to kind of wrap your head around these kinds of things. One is, again, you showed up to something. Uh, you were a little uncomfortable with it. You got on stage. You were doing a self-assessment of your, uh, you know, of your of the people that you were with, and it pushed you to that next level. And I think, uh, isn't that kind of one of the things that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what level you're at. <laughs> you, you feel like you always need, right. Just a just a, just a little nudge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a hard line. It's a hard, I guess, uh, decision. Like at one hand, you don't want to always be comparing yourself, right. Of like, you're all, you're never satisfied because there's always somebody better than you. Like no matter what you're, no matter how good you are in life at anything, there's always somebody better than you. And so like, you don't want to be getting that trap of like, I'm not happy because I'm, I'm not as good as that person. But at the same time, if you're the smartest person in every room you go into, you're in the wrong room, right? We've all heard that. And so when there, again, I I don't even, I'm not good at that line. I'll admit, I I'm generally comparing myself to the next level, always trying to strive up because I want to do better. But I just think there's such value in knowing like, Hey, I'm good right now. I'm complete with who I am. I am happy here. However, I still love the idea of pushing myself and trying for the next thing because I've got potential that I see in myself and I'm going to see if I can do it. Uh, and I think finding the balance between those two things is, is such a secret to happiness. It, it definitely is. And I, and I think that a lot of people don't really embrace the, the vision, the goal setting and all those kinds of things, which are really, really, really important. You have to sit down and be intentional with your relationships, with your health, with your finances, uh, all of those things, guys. Now, you just did a mastermind in, in Maui that, um, you know, I know people can go take a look at how, how do people find that? Yeah, it's a uh, Maui masterclass.com. Uh, it's a, uh... Yeah, we've done a few of them now. Me and Tarl Yarber, the guy that introduced you and I. Uh, Tarl's an amazing event coordinator. And uh, apparently I can get people to show up in Maui, which is, it's a tough sell, but you know, some people do it. And uh, we hang out and talk real estate for a few days. But yeah, that's a big piece, actually a big piece. I've done three of them now. And a big piece of all of them is we all work on vision together because almost everyone shows up to these things with going, you know, I just don't know what to do next. I got a lot of opportunity, a lot of options, but I haven't nailed down what I want to do. So that's kind of our focus heavily is like, by the time you leave this thing, you know exactly where you're going. You've got a clearly written vision for your future. And then you know how you're going to get there. And then the relationships come with it. Yeah. And I I think that whether people acknowledge it or not, I think a lot of people have that thought in their heads that, you know, because it doesn't matter. Didn't matter when I was in high school, I was in college, which is starting in business or even uh, an EO, YPO, or whatever setting I was in, there was always somebody, uh, the fight, the money was never really the issue, the driver of anything. It was always, okay, like, you, you know, you, you know, there was always like, what, what's next? And, you know, they were always kind of looking for that, you know, I guess a little more structure, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it, everybody struggles with this all the time. No matter how successful you are, you struggle with that. Like what's the, what's the next thing I need to do and then how am I going to get, going to get there? And then, I mean, that's really probably what separates successful people from not successful people is not successful people just never have that conversation internally, right? Like if, if there's, if, if somebody is successful, most likely they're the kind of person who says, where do I want to go? And then at some point they figure that out and then they make a step to be able to get there. But yeah, it's, it's shocking how few people set goals, how few people read books, how few people set, uh, you know, attend masterminds or go to conferences because the majority of the world is just simple and they're happy, right? Or maybe they're not happy, but they're, they're complacent with where they are in life. And a lot of times they're not happy, but they just don't know how to get out of it. But yeah, I, it's such an important piece of life. Yeah, it is. We, we, um, we, we started a mastermind with, you know, George Gammon. Um, uh, I know and- the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, you know, and, and uh, Jason Hartman, and and, uh, and and so it's interesting. We've been having these calls, and we had one actually yesterday. Uh, and you know, to your point, these are these are folks with means. These are people that sold their businesses. These are people that own a lot of units. Uh, you, you know, these are people that are maybe looking for some kind of career change. Um, and, and, um, so I think what's interesting is I, what I love is that they all get on there and they're fully transparent. They're fully authentic and said, this is what I'm trying to do. I don't know if it's the right path. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and I think, uh, that's, that's part of the, the, the first step 
is it's just being, you know, that kind of raw, right? Yeah, it's so, so important. Like that community of people you surround yourself with, whether it's a small mastermind group of two, three, four, five people, whether it's an organization like EO or or YPO or I'm part of one called Go Abundance or whether it's like the Maui yeah. Masterclass thing, whatever that thing is, like finding a place where you can build those lifelong relationships and be vulnerable and be open and getting out of your current circumstances. There's this great um, phrase by uh, the famous psychologist, uh, Abraham Maslow, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. So in one of his books, he talks about this thing. He calls it uh, a peak experience. And a peak experience is this moment in life or these moments in life where it like transcends the day to day of like boring every, every day. Right. So when you go to camp, when you're a kid, those are usually peak experiences. When you go to a really good conference and you're hanging out with your buddies, that's like a peak experience. Uh, this thing in Maui that we do, it's a peak experiences. And and Maslow talks a lot about how like in these moments are when we make these pivots in our life, these changes uh, and these like life altering decisions that affect our life. And the thing is most people, well, I should say this, those moments of peak experiences do not happen naturally when you're an adult. When you're a kid, right? They happen all the time. I mean, how many times when you're a kid, you have that late night Taco Bell run with your buddies and you're out there like three in the morning, eating a, drinking a Slurpee and having these like life conversations. Like those were amazing and they happened naturally back then. But adults will go 20, 30 years without a single one unless we are intentional about creating those, which again, full circle goes back to why I think it's so important to like just say yes to those things and go to that event and go to that conference, even though you're not sure what you're going to get out of it. It just gets you out of the day to day and gets you into a moment of peak experience. It, it definitely does. So um, let's turn to real estate real quick. Um, you know, obviously we just had the eviction moratorium lifted. I know yeah. in some states uh, it's still there. Um, you know, what do you guys, and I know you're around just that bigger pockets and all those guys and they're lifelong learners and they're personal development guys. And that's why I love, I love that whole brand and, and what you're creating as well. What do you see uh, moving forward for, you know, both renters and landlords and, um, you know, what's your crystal ball? Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you a few <laughs> guesses. Uh, my, my assumption is this, first of all, the, the whole eviction thing, I think was more of a, for the most part, more of a media way to sell papers and get clicks than it was an actual issue. Most people I know that own real estate didn't have a massive problem with tenants not paying even during all of COVID. Like most people still seem to pay rent. Most people like at least, yeah, nothing crazy happened in our, I mean, there was a few extreme examples where we had a tenant that was taken advantage of for a long time, but most people either paid rent or we worked with them uh, and we're getting it all back right now. We just restructured how they paid us and it's fine. So first of all, I don't foresee a massive like foreclosure or eviction backlog happening. I mean, maybe it will. Again, I, I know there's some data that shows that there's some stuff coming, but I just, I don't, don't see it. But what I do see is a world where increasingly the government is going to make housing more of a right than it is a privilege. And so I think that we're going to see a lot more expansion of government programs to help people pay their rent. Uh, as we clear through the mess of COVID, I think we're going to see more and more of that, of money being printed and given to landlords. So I like, it's not, it's not yeah. you know, I, we get a lot of people on our show when we do our lives on Monday and they are kind of upset about this. And I'm like, guys, you're landlords, like you the benefit of that, you know? Yeah, exactly. If the government wants to print money and then give me that money and then inflation, if that happens because of what they're doing, then my properties would go up in value. It's kind of a, we're, we're sitting in a good spot right here. Like I'm glad to be in this spot and I'm not on this part that's supposed to be taken from the government, you know, like, you know, in order to live, I like, I like where we're sitting and I feel like either way we're going to be fine. Uh, yeah, and you've, you've said that too, with yeah. your uh, portfolio too, we haven't had much of an issue with the, um, we have, I know I was, you know, like people you know, I, I say that, guys, listen, what you should be mostly concerned about is the, you know, the pandemic unemployment, uh, the PUA is going away. The pandemic emergency unemployment comp or the PEUC is going away. And, uh, you know, the federal pandemic uh, unemployment comp or the, you know, uh, the FPUC is going away all in a week or two. Um, and, and that was money that was given to people so that they could pay your rent, so you could pay your mortgage. And, and I, to your point, man, a lot of these folks, they, uh, you know, the government was giving them money to, to help them stay in housing. And I think, uh, I think the next 
the next few months are going to be very, very interesting to see. Um, but I went through 2008 and, um, you know, people figure it out. You, you know, what will happen is that some people will move out and they won't pay their landlord. Uh, they'll go to collection and that'll figure itself out the way it figures itself out. Uh, that will, vacancy will reopen up and they'll stick a tenant in there that can pay and life will return to normal pretty quickly. Wouldn't you yeah. agree? I do. And you know, like people ask me a lot, like, do you, is now a bad time to get into real estate because of like, people might not pay. I'm like, look, if you look at a 20 year horizon and during that time, there were six or eight months where like the worst happened where you got zero rent for six months because you had some tenant take advantage of you over the course of 20 years. When that property went from a million up to $3 million over that time period, like, are we gonna look back and be like, Oh yeah, it sure sucks. I missed out on that $5,000. Wish I would have never gotten into that game. So like, it's more important just to have reserves right now. If you're worried about it, just, so we have a lot of reserves. We're like, all right, if something happens, we can withstand some more, some more drama. And, uh, yeah, you can sometimes find a good deal, you know, in our YouTube channel, we were talking to a guy today that found a good deal because the tenant had it paid. So he got the property at about half off and then he gave the tenant $2,000 cash for keys and they moved out within a month. Yeah. I, I totally believe that. Yeah. I think, I think in fact, for people who are thinking instead of, oh no, the world's falling apart around me, there's, there's some people going, okay, the world might be falling apart in some ways. How do we capitalize on this? Right. So how, like, maybe creating a, a campaign that just says, Hey, we'll buy your property with your deadbeat tenant or whatever. You know, like, like going after that. Now all of a sudden you got a marketing arm that you can go after people and hit everybody who's, you know, filed eviction or whatever in the coming months. Like there are, there's opportunity here for both to help the landlord and maybe even the reset with the tenant. Like if there wasn't, if it was a legitimate issue or if it was a bad landlord that just didn't handle it right, maybe you're helping the, the tenant get out of a bad spot and buying a good property for a good deal and everyone can win. Yeah, and it, and I I'm a firm believer that uh, you get the best deals when there's a bit of chaos. Yeah, yeah, that's so yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. Like it could be chaos with the bank, it could be chaos with the tenant, it could be chaos with the landlord, it could be chaos with the property manager. But when there's a little disruption, and that's kind of the beautiful thing. I mean, when you look at Zillow and you're looking at houses, um, you know the market's I think pretty efficient. But, but when you when you're in the two, four, eight, twelve, twenty four hundred unit stuff, it's not very efficient, you know, with rents and expenses, and you know people are paying all over the map different kinds of rents and different lengths and all that kind of stuff. And people are moving in and moving out and and you know some people are managing well, and some people are are good landlords, and some people are not. and And so there's still massive opportunity, um, you know, by, 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 by stepping in and, you know, I always tell people, I love cleaning up neighborhoods. You know, we've, we've got plenty of projects in areas where the homeowners have come in afterwards and said, thank you. You, you know, thank you for, you know, uh, filling this up with, you know, a better quality tenant. Thank you for uh, upgrading the landscaping and fixing all the for maintenance. Um, you know, so there is a, there's a massive opportunity. It's a, it's a social opportunity in a lot of ways. Uh, I think that um, you know that that uh, that we're doing here too, because there's one thing for sure we're we're undersupplied on housing. That is for sure, and so that's why that's why no matter what happens, I I kind of cling to that as like we we do not have enough housing. So even if we have a hard time here in the next few months in the next year, like the 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 macro view of what's going on with real estate in the US right now i still feel very very good about it long term so as long as we have the reserves to be able to get through blips in the in the uh in the matrix here in the next few months i think we're going to be fine yeah the um hey before we wrap up i was i was having a conversation with a friend of mine and uh, i happen to be good friends with the, our governor he actually was in my EO forum. Oh, uh, nice. He started Cold Stone Creamery. But I, I was telling somebody the other day, I said, I don't think I've ever been so uh, in tune with who the governors are in these states right now, right? And, and the, the reason I bring that up is because I think that we really need to pay attention to the policies and the things that are happening state by state. Even now, with this eviction moratorium that just got lifted, you know, there's 11 states that are still enforcing, uh, at least uh, in the short term. Uh, you know, we're talking about Washington, D.C. We're talking about New Mexico. We're talking about some states are still kind of enforcing. New York, them. California. New York, California. Yeah. So they're, uh, you know, uh, the, wouldn't you agree that now more than ever, we need to start drilling down into that 
um, into the governmental policies, kind of the day to day things that are happening. Uh, and people need to start paying attention to the stuff that's getting passed. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that's a, actually and a huge piece of it. If you're trying to get into real estate, especially the larger multi, I feel like if you want to buy a single family house or duplex, you can do it in California. I'm sure like the p- policies are annoying there, but you can survive. But I'm, I'm such a big believer in like looking at the location and saying is overall is the direction this state moving going to help me over the next 20 years or hurt me over the next 20 years. And that should play. It's I guess not the number one thing, right. But it's definitely in the top five of me of like, you know, the job growth and the, and the type of employment that's there and uh, the income levels and whether or not this is a friendly to investors, friendly to business or not state. And so, yeah, paying attention to that is, is going to be huge for people getting into multifamily, especially. It is. I've had a lot of friends call, you know, uh, during this time, during the pandemic time. And one of them was Morgan and he was a, Big time D1 college coach uh, at one of the you know big schools, and, and he bought some rentals in Oregon. He's like, he goes, I, I don't know what I can do. You know, I've got I'm capped on my rents, um, and they're jacking me on my property tax. And so you know, all of a sudden, I went from cash flow to now I'm getting tight. And yeah. and you know, so so I think that's kind of the point is it, it, you need to start taking a look at when they start telling you how much you can charge and and then they start getting you on the property tax side, which I think I think uh the I think real estate uh owners are gonna really take it in the chin here, uh, you know, because a lot of these places they can't they can't support their uh you know the expenses in a particular area because people are moving. And uh, so they're going to go after the property taxes. Uh, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, I can totally see that. I think that it's it's an easy thing for the local governments to be like, oh, we need more money. Let's just let's just tax the homeowners more, uh, especially as they have a lot of equity in their properties. People are like, well, they got they got this huge net worth. Let's go after the people who have a, have a big net worth. You know, even though mostly they can't tap into that, and and it's phantom anyway. But yeah, I definitely agree. They're going to go after the. Uh, going to go after the property taxes. It seems like the easiest tax to do without having to get a whole lot of, a, a whole lot of approval. It is. I know we look a lot around about that. You know, certainly we have as we've kind of moved around and bought stuff in different states. But I think even more so, you people should start paying attention to, you know, who's in office and, and, and some of the things that are going to, the restrictions potentially that you might have. Um, so Brandon, uh, before we wrap up, what's the best way for people to find your book? You know, your two new books. I can't wait to, um, you know, see the success of those and, and the mastermind and, and what's the best way for people to reach out? Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, probably, I mean, biggerpockets.com slash store is probably the best place for, uh, for books that we've got. So any of my books are at biggerpockets.com slash store, or honestly, if you go to my Instagram, uh, like, you know, they give you like one link in your bio that link goes to a, what are they called? Link tree that has like my books, the Maui masterclass, which is Maui masterclass.com, but the masterclass is in there and anything else that I've got going on. That's important. Like we're launching a coffee brand. We're not, we're not gonna make any money with it. All the, all the profits go to charity, but it's fun to have beardy brew coffee. <laughs> it's just like a, <laughs> that's a fun thing. So uh, I'll send you some beardy brew coffee sometime. Yeah. It's, it's oh, good stuff. I definitely need to get some of that. Yeah, well, it's good stuff. As always, let's um, let's jump on, uh, you know, after this kind of pans out and kind of see what goes on with this eviction moratorium and the forbearance ends. And uh, I know you're still buying. We're still buying. We just closed on 650 units in Houston. I got another 455 in escrow in Austin that we're working on. And I know, uh, didn't you put another mobile home park in escrow? Yeah, I think we got two more. I think we actually have four in escrow right now that we're closing on the next couple of months. On, so yeah, right we've on. been buying. Yeah. So guys, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I hope they really listen to this for the once because uh, I think you can learn a lot from uh, from Brandon in the future. He's definitely someone to watch. He's growing his brand in, in every way, and he's a fabulous educator. Uh, Brandon, oh, thank, thank you, you again. I appreciate your time. Hey, and, thank you, uh, guys. God bless you guys, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Cheers.